Hi, I'm Micah with the Carver County Parks Department and welcome to our maple syrup virtual tour. We're out here today at Baylor Regional Park in Norwood Young America and it is a great day for maple syruping. I bet a lot of us like to put maple syrup on our pancakes, but before we pick it up at the grocery store, there's a lot that needs to happen first. We need to identify a maple tree. We need to tap it, collect the sap, boil it and bottle it. And today we're gonna show you how we do it all here at the park. You may have heard that maple syruping can only be done in the spring. And that's because we need it to be freezing at night and thawing during the day. That creates a pressure inside the tree so that when we tap through the bark, it's like squeezing a wet sponge and the sap comes right out. There's only a few short weeks in the whole year. It also happens to be that in the spring is when the tree is moving sugar stored down in its roots up to the branches to make new leaves for the summer. So what's the big deal with maples? It's because they're way more sugary than most other kinds of trees especially sugar maples, whose sap can be between 1 and 5% sugar, which is almost double most other kinds of trees. One of my favorite fun facts about maple syruping is that there's a very limited range of the world where you can find sugar maples, from here in Minnesota over to Maine, up into Canada, and a little bit down towards Tennessee. So we're lucky to live in one of the few places in the whole world where we can experience maple syruping firsthand. Before we even tap a tree, we need to make sure that it's a sugar maple. So here's some identification clues that we look for. Leaves are the first thing that people think of. You might think of the Canadian flag or maybe the water towers in Chanhassen. The leaf of a maple typically has five pointed lobes on it. Most of us recognize it, but this time of year, leaves aren't very abundant or useful for identifying a tree. Some other signs include streaks of black where sap has leaked out of the tree and mold has grown on the sap sugar. We also look for white splotches of lichen that grow on commonly on sugar maples as well. What we're typically looking for in bark is what we call shaggy bacon bark, where it looks like a piece of bacon curling up from frying. The branches often have an elbow-like appearance where they're bending towards the sunlight. At the end of the branches, the twigs have opposite branching patterns. Rather than going left, right, left, right down the stem, they have a partner directly across from them. The buds on a sugar maple are brownish red and overlapping scales that come to a point. After a tree's been tapped, it leaves behind little belly button scars. So if you trust yourself or the people that came before you, that's another good way to identify a sugar maple. Once we've actually identified a maple tree, it's finally time to tap. On the sunny south side, we use a hand drill and burrow three inches into the tree to reach the xylem layers where sap flows through cellular tubing. Similar to a healthy human donating blood, this process is relatively gentle on the tree and will not kill it. Once we clean out the hole, we finally get to actually tap the tree and set this file with a hammer. On a warm day, the sap will start flowing immediately. We hang a bag and frame over the tap to collect the sap. Here's a look at another form of tap which uses plastic tubing to collect in buckets. Larger operations use long tubing hooked up to a vacuum system to automatically suck the sap back to their buildings, but out here, we like to do it the old fashioned way. On a warm sunny day, after a freezing night, we may see as much as a gallon or more of sap in one day from one tap. We can put in multiple taps if the tree is big enough and we give the other taps enough space. After our sap has had enough time to accumulate, we bring it here to this naturally refrigerated storage tank where it is automatically pumped into the sugar shack. If sap is given enough time to warm up, it'll turn cloudy with bacteria and spoil the batch. So time is of the essence. Inside our sugar shack, we see our automatic feeding tube, which delivers sap to our evaporator pan, which is fire heated and rolls at a boil all day long. As you may have heard, it takes an average of 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup, depending on how sugary your sap is. The steam coming off our sap is mostly just water, leaving the sugar behind. How long this process takes depends on the heat of your fire and surface area of the pan. But this part is one of the biggest investments of time and resources, which helps to explain the high cost of natural maple syrup compared to the imitation corn syrup. The sap goes in at about 2% sugar, and our final product is 66% sugar. But if we were to try to do that in this wood heated pan, we would certainly burn the sugar, which is why we transfer it to a smaller gas heated pan as it gets closer to syrup. Here we can keep a close eye on the temperature. Pure water will boil at 212 degrees, but maple syrup with the sugar added will boil at 219 degrees. As we get closer to that mark, we run it through a strainer to remove natural minerals and place it in our final pan, which can be closely monitored. Using this hydrometer, which floats in syrup, we can determine our sugar percentage and aim for that 66% sugar content. Lastly, it gets put into sample bottles for us to give away at our educational programs. Long before the Europeans came to North America, the native people here discovered maple syruping. Specifically in Minnesota, that's the Dakota and Ojibwe tribes. However, they used natural materials, such as this birch bark basket called a macuck. 
Since the Native Americans relied heavily on oral tradition rather than a written language, most of what we know about their maple syruping practices comes from stories passed down from generation to generation. Clearly, there's a lot of work that goes into making the maple syrup that goes on your pancakes. If you enjoyed learning about the syruping process, we highly recommend you come to our maple syrup open house next year. Get to see it all in person and taste test our homemade maple syrup. Please also send us your comments and questions or pictures of your own maple syruping setup. Thanks for coming to our maple syruping virtual tour. We'll see you in the parks.